Besides the legislators here with us tonight, we owe another person our thanks this evening, Governor Jay Nixon. Not only did he veto House Bill 253, he worked like few governors have ever worked on an issue so critical to the future of public education in our state. He participated in nearly 40 events throughout our state, educating Missourians about the harmful impact of House Bill 253. Governor Nixon has always been a solid friend of our public schools, but what he did this summer was truly remarkable. He is with us here tonight. Please join me in welcoming to our stage Governor Jay Nixon. Thank you, Phil, and to the entire Missouri School Boards Association, superintendents, school leaders, the roundtable, Dr. Jasinski, and others. I thank you for having me here with you this evening. I want to take just a moment to reflect on how far we've come, where we are today, and the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. But first, I want to thank you. Early on in the summer, a reporter asked me whether I thought my veto of House Bill 253 would be sustained. Given the makeup of the legislature, the trend we've seen around the country towards these kind of drastic tax cuts, and the multi-million dollar ad campaign financed by one very wealthy individual, a lot of folks figured we had an uphill fight in our hands. But I said with six million Missourians on our side, I liked our odds. And we knew that educators, administrators, and board members, the people in this room, and the thousands of others across the state that this small subset of our Army represents, will be some of our most important partners in this effort. But I have to tell you, quite frankly, I underestimated you. In every corner of our state, from Gainesville to Grandview, from St. Joe to St. Louis, Scotland County to Springfield, the response was overwhelming. Teachers, board members, and superintendents, irrespective of party, came forward and seized the opportunity to talk about the vital importance of public schools to our communities and how House Bill 253 would have imperiled it. You formed a grassroots coalition of educators, administrators, business groups, first responders, and faith leaders. You turned out at public meetings by the hundreds. You wrote letters and lit up phone lines. Together, you told legislators that the choice was clear. They could support education, or they could support House Bill 253, but they could not do both. You spoke for our schools, for our families, for every Missourian. You spoke with one voice for our future. So on behalf of those six million Missourians, thank you. Together, we scored a significant victory that sent a clear message that here in Missouri, public education is a value. And when the ideologues who don't share that value try to defund our schools, we fight back and we win. And with that victory, and your ongoing commitment to public education, you've helped protect a legacy that spans generations, a tradition of working to bend the arc of history towards greater opportunity for all Americans. Nearly 200 years ago, in 1820, the first Missouri Constitution was adopted. James Monroe was president. Missouri had not yet formally entered the Union. That very first Constitution declared that, quote, schools and the means of education shall be forever encouraged in this state. It called for schools to be established in each township as soon as practicable and necessary, and for the poor to be taught for free. It would take many more years and many fits and starts before our public school system developed into the one we all recognize. But those words, forever and free, 
reflected something important about the way Missourians valued public education even way back then. On the walls of the governor's office in the Missouri State Capitol are four murals by Gary Melchers. One of them depicts a well-to-do St. Louisan named Susan Blow. While traveling in Germany in the mid-1800s, she took note of the positive impact kindergarten classes were having on children there. She brought these ideas back home to Missouri and began the country's first public kindergarten program in St. Louis in 1873. Within six years, more than 50 other schools had started a kindergarten program. And right here in the Show Me State, a national education movement was born. Seventy years later, the greatest generation would return from the Second World War after liberating tens of millions from the grip of tyranny. At that point, post-secondary education was considered a privilege of the upper classes. The GI Bill, shepherded through Congress by Missouri Senator Champ Clark, changed everything. Over the next decade, millions of Americans received an education that they may not have otherwise received. The number of degrees awarded by U.S. colleges and universities more than doubled between 1940 and 1950. Over the next half century, the percentage of Americans with a college degree quintupled, rising from 4.6 to 25 percent. They became engineers and entrepreneurs, scholars and Supreme Court justices, presidents and preschool teachers. They bought homes, started families, and launched companies, creating the modern middle class and powering a post-war economic boom that made the U.S. the driver of the global economy and the undisputed leader of the free world. I make these points because they demonstrate what our state and our nation have known for more than a century. To build a great community, you must first build a school. And to build a great school, you need a strong community. To teach children well, you must teach them early. And to grow the economy and strengthen the middle class, there is no better investment we can make than in education. So today, we stand together at another important moment for education in our state and in our nation. A key battle has been won, but our fight must continue. The misguided economic theories of House Bill 253 that they were based on are still being touted. Its supporters retain majorities in the State House and Senate, and its financial backers have millions more to spend. And in Washington, as folks on the far ends of the ideological spectrum yell louder and louder, the space for rational dialogue seems to get smaller and smaller. Lost in a din are not only the fundamental values that unite us, but the tremendous diversity that strengthens us. Here in this room, we've got outdoorsmen and urbanites, hunters and theater buffs, Royals fans and Cardinals fans. We come from many different backgrounds and have plenty of disagreements. Try to separate us into two camps and you will miss the rich diversity that is our state. No one that understands Missouri that thinks you can divide it by two and understand it understands the show me state. I grew up in DeSoto, and like most small towns, the public school was the center of our community. Dad was mayor, and mom was the president of the local school board. My schoolmates were kids of doctors and mechanics, farmers and lawyers, folks from different parties and all walks of life. I didn't realize it at the time, but that's where I learned about what community is really all about. We all rooted for the dragons on Friday nights. We all recited the Pledge of Allegiance each and every morning. We all dreaded the pop quizzes from Mr. Pinturf. And we all learned about the history of our great nation. But we did all of those things together. But as we've seen this week in Washington, D.C., it's easier to create division 
and to embrace diversity. It's easier to sell a magical quick fix to our economy than it is to walk the long road to recovery. It's easier to play politics than to tackle the substance of policy. And it's easier to point out what's wrong with our schools than it is to work each day to improve them. I make that point because, friends, we've got the harder task. But today, as we stand on the shoulders of all who have fought for the opportunities we enjoy, it's our responsibility to do that hard work and to leave our schools and our state better than we found them. Like I said, we're a diverse state. And in each of your communities, you face different challenges. But in this, we are united. We believe that all children should have the opportunity to live up to their God-given potential. We believe that teaching is an honorable profession that should be respected and rewarded, not ridiculed. We believe that the way to improve our schools is by lifting them up to reach higher standards, not tearing them down. We believe that our students, that if our students aren't prepared, our economy won't thrive. And we believe that public funds should be used for public schools. <laughs> now, these are the principles that we fought to defend and the foundation on which we now must build. Make no mistake, there will be other unaffordable, ill-conceived tax bills. There will be other radical experiments masked as reforms and plenty of politicians who think they can score points by attacking our schools. Together, we've shown that when Missourians are engaged to understand the policy, they have the capacity to see beyond the politics. They set aside their differences. They fight for their communities. And the rational center of our great state holds, literally as I traveled this state, almost 40 open public settings. You saw people treated us with incredible respect, waited a long time, asked their governor questions in public with their neighbors there. Nobody yelled at me. Nobody raised their tone. They listened, they talked, and we didn't all agree. But in winning today's battles, we can't lose sight of the broader challenge before us, making sure every Missouri student has the skills to succeed in college or the career of his or her choice. In a way, Missouri's founders could not have imagined when they put pen to paper back in 1820, the competition we're in is global. And to win it, we need to raise our game. Not only with more funding, but clearer goals, higher expectations, greater accountability, and a commitment to excellence. <laughs> On that note, we thank the Potterfields for putting a million dollars of skin in the game to demand some of that excellence. I thank them for being here this evening. It's what business leaders in this state feel about education is they love it so much they want to make it better and they're willing to put their dollars on the line to make it better. I appreciate their generosity. Let me talk just a moment about what the global competition looks like. In South Korea, the high school graduation rate is 93%. In Canada, 56% of adults already have a college our university credential. And in Finland, teachers are selected from the top 10% of graduates. And thousands compete each year for those coveted slots. Now, those GIs that came back nearly 70 years ago to build the American dream fought to make sure their grandchildren and great-grandchildren would have more opportunities and a better life than they'd had not to see them fall behind. And that is exactly why my budget for fiscal year 2015 will include a historic investment in our K-12 classrooms and make a significant down payment 
on fully funding the formula by the end of my term. <laughs> Now, with these additional resources, we'll expand technology in the classroom, provide more training for teachers, and instead of a cruise to graduation day, we'll transform the senior year of high school into a high-impact, intensive training ground for going to college or beginning a career. And with higher funding come higher expectations. Just as the information economy is demanding more of our students, we've got to demand more of ourselves. We're all, we've all got to do better. And that means everybody, students and teachers, parents and principals, coaches and college presidents. That is why, as we make this historic investments in our schools, we're also continuing to implement the common core standards in our MSIP 5 system. These are tough, rigorous, but vital accountability measures that will help us build on our strengths and improve on our weaknesses. And they are only the beginning. Again, ours is the harder job, but we should not, we cannot allow those who don't believe in public education to be the only ones who talk about the need to improve it. We must take on that mantle. We must embrace that challenge. We've got to believe in education so much that we're willing to work to make it better. My mom held these beliefs with conviction. For years, she taught special education in public schools and eventually worked her way up to a position in administration. But when she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, instead of retiring, she went back to the classroom so she could spend the time she had left with those kids. It added months and immeasurable joy to her life. I'm sure many of you have stories like that, of how the simple act of sharing knowledge, of seeing that first spark of understanding in a child, like turning on a light in the darkness, illuminates something fundamental and connects us with what really matters, the work we do, the love we show to one another, and the legacy we leave to our kids. That's why we're here. I want to thank each of you again for your commitment and dedication to public education. You have answered a call to make our communities and our state stronger and more prosperous for generations to come. We value that contribution, and we thank you for your tireless commitment. Together, we will continue to build that bright and more prosperous future by fulfilling the promise made by our forebears here in the Show Me State two centuries ago. Forever support public schools, free for every Missouri child, in every Missouri community. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you, Governor Nixon, for being with us tonight, and thank you again for all the great work you did to protect pu public education in our state and to de defeat House Bill 253. As a token of our appreciation, we are pleased to present you this award from MSBA, recognizing your outstanding support for public education in our state.